are we unique, Kim's experience and my experience, growing up, basically not knowing what the Old Testament was about, except mm -hmm. that there were a lot of really good guys that we ought to try to be like, um, dare to be a Daniel? If we were studying something from David, it would not be that he peeked at naked women and got <laughs> husbands killed by putting them in the front line of battle. <laughs> Whoops, there's a piece of this story that's missing. Yes. But you did hear he was a man after God's own Absolutely. heart. Absolutely. Yeah. On this edition of the White Horse Inn, what would Moses do? How should we read and interpret Old Testament stories? White Horse Inn, know what you believe and why you believe it. Five centuries ago, in taverns and public houses across Europe, the masses would gather for discussion and debate over the latest ideas sweeping the land. From one such meeting place, a small Cambridge inn called the White Horse, the Reformation came to the English-speaking world. Carrying on the tradition of the early reformers, welcome to the White Horse Inn. Welcome to another broadcast of the White Horse Inn. What would Moses do? We've all heard sermons, especially from the Old Testament, on the faithfulness of Abraham, David's heart for God, Joshua's leadership, and we were encouraged to dare to be a Daniel. But the Bible's nothing like Aesop's fables, you know, a story to illustrate a moral point. Abraham was in many ways a moral failure. Even his willingness to sacrifice Isaac wasn't an example for us, but was an occasion for God to foreshadow Christ as the ram caught in the thicket so that Isaac and the rest of us could go free. Moses was God's man, but wavered under the burden and was barred from leading God's people into Canaan. Joshua is not a source for leadership principles, unless we're planning on leading a campaign of destruction against idolatrous nations in order to establish righteousness in God's holy land. Yet read in the light of the history of redemption, Joshua and his ministry point forward to Jesus and his person and work. David can only ambiguously be held up as a heroic example. Because of his failures, in fact, God didn't allow him to build the temple, but gave this honor to his son Solomon. David's main role in the story is to presage his greater son, who assumed the everlasting throne that God promised to David's heir. Given the moralistic expectations often assumed, it's no wonder that people find the Old Testament boring and much of the New Testament incomprehensible. Contrast this approach that I've just mentioned to Luther's interpretation of the story of David and Goliath. Quote, When David overcame the great Goliath, there came among the Jewish people the good report and encouraging news that their terrible enemy had been struck down and that they had been rescued and given joy and peace. And they sang and danced and were glad for it. Thus, this gospel of God, or New Testament, is a good story and report, sounded forth into all the world by the apostles, telling of a true David who strove with sin, death, and the devil, and overcame them, and thereby rescued all those who were captive in sin, afflicted with death, and overpowered by the devil. End quote. As Graham Goldsworthy comments, the important thing to note is that Luther has made here the link between the saving acts of God through David and the saving acts of God through Christ. Once we see that connection, it's impossible to use David as a mere model for Christian living, since his victory was, was vicarious, and the Israelites could only rejoice in what was won for them. In terms of our interpretive principles, we see David's victory as a salvation event in that the existence of the people of God in the promised land was at stake, end quote. So see, instead of drawing a straight line of application from the narrative to us, which typically moralizes or allegorizes these stories, we're taught by Jesus himself to understand these passages in the light of their place in the unfolding drama of redemption that leads to Christ. Moralistic preaching, the bane of conservatives and liberals alike, assumes that we're really not helpless sinners who need to be rescued, but decent folks who just need a few good examples, exhortations, and instructions. However, Goldsworthy continues, quote, We are not saved by our changed lives. The changed life is the result of being saved and not the basis of it. The basis of salvation is the perfection in the life and death of Christ presented in our place. By reverting to either allegorical interpretation on the one hand, or to prophetic literalism on the other, 
Some evangelicals have thrown away the hermeneutical gains of the reformers in favor of a medieval approach to the Bible. Evangelicals have had a reputation for taking the Bible seriously, Graham Goldsworthy concludes, but even they have traditionally propagated the idea of the short devotional reading from which a blessing from the Lord must be wrested. Goldsworthy calls attention to the difference between this message and Reformation Christianity. Quote, The pivotal point of turning in evangelical thinking, which demands close attention, is the change that has taken place from the Protestant emphasis upon the objective facts of the gospel and history to the medieval emphasis on the inner life. The evangelical who sees the inward transforming work of the Spirit as the key element of Christianity will soon lose contact with the historic Christian faith and the historic gospel. Inner directed Christianity, which reduces the gospel to the level of every other religion of the inner man, might well use a text from the Apocrypha to serve it as its own epitaph for the reformers. There are others who are remembered. They are dead, and it is as though they never existed. This is our subject as we take up a very important question here. How do we interpret the Old Testament? Uh, do we moralize the Old Testament? Do we read it as the story of Christ, unfolding witness to Jesus Christ in history, or do we use the Old Testament to uh, create examples for us to imitate for our own stories of transformed life? Uh, that is going to be our subject. What would Moses do with Kim Riddlebarger, pastor of Christ Reformed Church in Anaheim, California? Rod Rosenblatt teaches at Concordia uh, University, Irvine, and is a Lutheran minister. And Kevin, Ken Jones, who is the pastor of Greater Union Baptist Church in Compton, California, and I'm Mike Court, and I teach at Westminster Seminary, California. First of all, uh, you know, in our last program, we talked about uh, more generally the tendency to confuse law and gospel. And in this program, we're going to look at one of the ways that's done, particularly by going to the Old Testament and mining it for quotes or examples that we use and character studies character studies yeah, that we use boy, I grew up on those yeah I did too I mean are are we unique Kim's experience and my experience growing up basically not knowing what the Old Testament was about except mm -hmm. that there were a lot of really good guys that we ought to try to be like yeah a lot of wars and stuff like that yeah, a lot yeah. of the gaps Lutheran and pietism uh, you had that um, Dare to be a Daniel? Well, we didn't have the catch. We don't have the class to have those catchy titles. <laughs> but, um, what would that be in the, German? In, <laughs> Dare to conquer Germany. No, I was Dare with the Norwegians. Oh, yeah. that's right. And Dare to I was with France. the Scandinavians. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, Around but, the so, yeah, line we somehow go. it always caches out yeah. as <laughs> Deutschland over alles. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, if we were studying something from David. It would not be that he peeked at naked women and got <laughs> husbands killed by putting them in the front line of battle. <laughs> Whoops, there's a piece of this story that's missing. Yes, yeah. but that was gone. That was absent. But, uh, but you did hear he was a man after God's own Absolutely. heart. Absolutely. Yeah. And always pointing to his moral fortitude as the reason he was a man after God's own yep. heart. And it was kind of a shock to me when I read Psalm 51 and yeah. read the story of... David's failings and and well, I I just heard that he was a man after God's own heart. And I was supposed to have right. be like David, Emulated. have friends like Jonathan, and all the rest of it. Yeah. yeah, but it's really not about David, is it? David, instead of Jesus playing a bit role in David's life, hmm. David was playing a bit role in Jesus' life. David yeah. was the king of Israel, who was the genetic ancestor of the true king of Israel. That's mm -hmm. why David's in the story of the Old Testament, and so. When you get David, and then after David, Solomon, who was also ambiguous in his faithfulness, mm -hmm. then you get this whole history of almost entirely bad kings. Yeah, by the way, if you want to call marrying, what, 900 women, none of whom were believers, ambiguous, yeah, he was <laughs> ambiguous. Oh, a nice pick, adjective for it. Pick, pick, pick. <laughs> Uh, they, but they all moved to Utah, and that was okay. <laughs> well, my three wives are hard enough to keep up with their own. <laughs> um, when you think of the promise that God made to David.